So what, what do you have to say about the Yuga cycle of the ages and our conscious awakening? Because I just interviewed Barbara Marks Hubbard yesterday, and mm-hmm. she was talking about this, and it made me aware of the fact that if we don't wake up to a new level of consciousness, like Einstein once said, if we don't, we're never going to come up with the solutions to the problems from the same level of awareness that created the problems. So we have to uh, almost hope and have faith, but it seems like there's a lot of evidence that we are going through a transformation, and even ancient traditions are pointing to this, even from 13,000 years ago. What would you have to say to that? I I think that's absolutely uh, the case. We have in ancient traditions around the world, and I've been looking at this very closely, so you have it in every hemisphere around the world, on every continent, this concept of if, if if they don't call it the Yuga cycle one place, they call it by something else. Yeah, exactly. And do you see and, do you, you see the same trend, the same pattern, the same concept of essentially going through a cycle, going through we'll call it a golden age, silver age, bronze age, iron age, going through some some cultures will talk in terms of a processional cycle, uh, a yuga cycle, uh, the cycle of the different sons of the Maya the Mayan cycle that we've heard so much about. But what I'm impressed by is it's a very similar concept in numerous different ancient cultures. And when you start seeing similarities like that, to me it says that there's probably some real underlying basis. And I'm convinced with my own work on ancient civilizations that there is an underlying basis for that. And you just mentioned 13,000 years ago, there's a lot of evidence that we had very high, very sophisticated civilization, cultures, at the end of the last ice age. And these were, went down, they were, there was a huge demise, there was actually, I think, some kind of catastrophic events at the end of the last ice age. We went into essentially a dark age, and then we came out of it again, but we go through the cycles, we go through the swings in civilization, and I would say not just civilization, but really our mental being, our mentality, our way of thinking, our um, different mental abilities, if I could put it that way. Yeah, and this new consciousness seems to be dragging some of us, kicking and screaming, but towards yeah. a, an idea of oneness, which is in direct conflict with ego personalities and the idea of limitedness and resources and fear and setting up territorialness all of these old ideas are are trying to fade away but at the same time they're trying to grab hold and unfortunately they have the military behind them and governments but as we enter into this new age it seems like there's something awakening underneath the fabric of space and time there's a consciousness coming through it almost reminds me of, have you ever seen these plates of sand with a speaker underneath it? where they, oh, yes. you know, it, it breaks it up into a mandala, you know, and it yeah. feels like there's a vibration coming through and breaking down old ideas, old governments, old, it's obviously collapsing. But oh, within yeah. that, there seems like something new. Yeah, and what I would say there is that this is very difficult, I believe, when you have a turnover in, of an age, I've spoken to a lot of people about this and looked at it, and I think a lot of times when you have a new concept, new idea, new mentality, what I'll call the turnover of an age, there is a lot of resistance to that from the status quo, from the conventional status quo that has vested interest in the old way of thinking, the old order of being, the old society. So they kick and they scream, they fight against it. So there is a lot of resistance, but I think that ties right in with the very concept that there is something new coming forward, something new developing. developing. And like you say, really, a new consciousness, if you want to call it a new vibration, a new pattern, and very much a new way, which is, in fact, I would say an old way of thinking. We're going back to our very ancient roots, the concept of the unity of all humanity. More than that, I believe the concept of the unity of all Earth, all creatures on Earth, 
and that we have to really get back to the concept that we don't destroy, we don't abuse the earth, we don't abuse ourselves and other organisms, we don't uh, exploit each other and organisms, but we see ourselves as, and I'm a firm believer in this, that we see ourselves, we need to see ourselves as a unified whole. And what we do makes a difference. And it really makes a difference. I believe that even what you think, it's this concept that everyone's an individual, the old way of thinking, and you don't influence other people, you don't influence other aspects of the world or the universe. I think that's wrong. There's lots of actually hardcore scientific evidence now that your very consciousness, your very thoughts have an influence, have an effect. Yeah, I mean, e even since the double slit experiment, we know that our consciousness can affect the exactly. atoms on a very atomic exactly. level. So it only makes sense that, and this is where the internet comes in, because even now, as we're doing this, and it's going to be put on the internet, there is something very mysterious about consciousness. It seems to take part and participate in anything that has the possibility of organizing itself in a coherent, translatable manner. And I think the more we can discuss these things and get them out on the internet mm -hmm. and start talking about them, I think it has a subtle effect on that underlying consciousness of the mass of people that are still watching CNN and Fox. Yeah, yeah, and entertaining themselves and being fed I hate to say it, by a bunch of status quo conventional thinking, which is trying to self-perpetuate. And we really need to change that. I have come to the conclusion that I'm trained very much as a scientist, as a classical scientist, a classical academic. I have a PhD in geology and geophysics. And I have come to the conclusion, as many other scientists who have really look deeply into these issues, that ultimately what is sort of at the bottom, what is the foundation of everything, and it's consciousness, it's thought, it's pattern, it's order, it's information. I think these are all variations, if you would, on the thing, but ultimately it's really consciousness that is underlying what we think of as the universe, what we think of as the material world. And this is a very different view, I believe, than the classical mechanistic, materialistic viewpoint that views animals, it views the planet, it even views other people as just material entities that are interacting with each other. Um, so I think we have really two major opposing competing world views and they are in conflict right now and I know which one I support and which one I believe is really the world view that um, should we say conforms to ultimate reality, and that is that consciousness really comes before everything else. Well, it, as a scientist, I'm sure you're familiar with the chaos theory, and it, so, right right now it seems like we're in that chaos theory with two systems: the old and the new trying to reform, with the old trying to restabilize itself. But that's a little bit like being eight months pregnant and trying to change your mind. Right, exactly. We're not, we're not going back. We either have to give birth to a new consciousness and a new world, a reality, or we're going to break down in chaotic mess. I think that's correct. I think that's correct. And going back to ancient times, I think this has occurred before, that there have been these changes. There have been these turnovers, should we say, say and thinking and mentality and change in consciousness. And I believe that's one of the lessons, if you would, are something that we have to understand when we talk about things like the Yuga cycle and the concept of world ages and this very ancient and universal belief that there are world ages, there are changes, major changes from time to time, and mentality and thinking and emphasis and technology that goes with that. Uh, so this is, in a sense, something new for us, but when you look at thousands and tens of thousands of years, I believe it's happened before. Yeah, I, I believe it has too, Robert. And I, I wrote a book about the social and neurological consequences of belief systems. Mm -hmm. And 
while I was writing that, I did a lot of research and interviews with rabbis and biblical scholars, and, and almost all of them says the same thing. Once you get to a certain academic level, down below, it's, uh, it's unpredictable. But up here, they all agree that it's a, a story that's been vastly misinterpreted and locked in because most of our Judeo-Muslim Christian religions are based upon a an Iron Age belief that may or may not have happened, and they haven't grown. And this this is why it seems like science and religion are hitting a wide gap now because religion is hanging on tight to dogma, where scientists are going, okay, this is what is, but maybe this is what could be. And right. scientists are always up for peer review, which this is one reason why I really admire what you've been. I've been following you for years. Oh, thank and you. And being an academic and having the courage to go out and question even the woo-woo stuff that they talk about, but question it at least to see if maybe we have this wrong. I mean, our whole world is based on beliefs, but what if they're wrong? What if they're wrong? And, and, and it seems like they are so diverse and so conflictive and out of touch with what we know about the physical sciences now, it's starting to have a dismantling effect on world religions. Yeah. And, and I see the ones that are, are reforming, are reforming with a more scientific view. Yeah, I think, I think really people talk about the split or division between science and religion. And to me, when you get at that higher level, that deeper level, however one wants to express it, you find that, no, in fact, there is a lot of commonality, and ultimately, you know, there's not this dogmatism. I, I, I shoot that dogmatism. We don't need that dogmatism. And also, you mentioned peer review. Peer review, in so many cases, I believe, in the sciences, yes, it serves a certain function, but it also serves a gatekeeper function, where who are the peers? They are the ones that are supporting the status quo and the dogmas of science. I mean, people talk about dogma and religion. It's just as much dogma in science. Yeah. Um, that's something we really need to move beyond if we're going to make progress. This is, this is where the courage comes in, because now you're up against uh, uh, grants and loans and uh, tenure and all this stuff that's coming from these nonprofit organizations that are traditionally really conform to the old paradigm and they tend to only I, you probably know this better than I do they, they tend to give money to that which supports the old paradigm the old regime that's absolutely the case and I, that's actually something I go into some detail in, in my forthcoming book Forgotten Civilization I actually talk about this quite a bit because I have I have felt this personal very oh, much I bet that uh, if the safe way to play it in academia, in scientific academia, actually any academia, is to go with the paradigm and you just make real incremental improvements, if you would, on the paradigm. But you certainly don't fuck the paradigm. You certainly don't look at anomalies. You certainly don't do anything that will fundamentally change the status quo. And so it's a real issue. It's a real problem. Right. Yeah, and, and I do see that even, even in, like in the science view, like even evolutionists. I've talked to evolutionists that seem to be locked into this rigid dogma of evolution, and they seem to leave out the fact that there is a missing link. I mean, yeah. some, something happened really quick-like between Homo erectus and Homo sapiens, and there's a gap there. So I'm going to just go ahead and ask you this, okay? Yeah, no, there's all kinds. Of, I want to say that there are so many anomalies in science. There's so much left out, and I find this all the time. And, you know, textbook science. Well, textbook science is textbook science, and they leave out the anomalies. They leave out the questions, and they make it sound like it's all, you know, settled, and that's that. And it's when you really get into it, it's not true. So 